Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about the forthcoming movie Stowaway, a movie about uh, space and space travellers, which I'd been a consultant on. Well, it's finally been released, and it's time for me to talk about the rest of the movie with the whole story now available for you all to watch. And yes, this means that there's going to be a lot of spoilers, so you might want to watch the movie first. It's on Netflix in the US and on other services in other parts of the world. And if you watch it and then stick around all the way through the end credits with all the cool people, then I'm listed as a script consultant alongside the actual experts. I mean, there's an algae expert and a tether expert listed in the end credits. Now, not all of you will have liked the ending, right? Some of you will have been, found that it ended on a bit of a downer. Some of you might have found that there are bits where there were obvious mistakes in the science, and I know that I saw those right away. But you know, now that the people that are worried about the spoilers are gone, let's start with one thing that was commented on by many people when we discussed the trailer. The basic premise has the crew is in danger because the life support system can't keep them alive during the voyage to Mars. And many of you pointed out this was unrealistically bad design if uh, adding one person pushed the mission over the edge. And you know it is. There's a couple of comments in the movie about how the operators had increased the crew from two to three and then cut down on unneeded shielding and other stuff to save mass. But all the same, surely there were other options to save them, right? Well, look, in the previous video, I made the comparison of this script to a, a classic sci-fi short story called The Cold Equations. And there was actually a story about the writing of that story, how the editor came up with the idea uh, of what the story should be, and he asked the writer to do it. And the writer came back, and the writer had figured out a way to save everybody. So the editor modified the scenario to make that solution impossible and then sent it back to the writer who then found another solution. Supposedly this happened a few times until the writer ran out of ideas and we got the version that we all know and I'm not sure love is the right word. But anyway, so from my point of view, when the script was presented to me, I immediately thought of a bunch of ways to solve the problem and keep everyone alive. But that's not what the writers want. They have an idea for a story with a beginning and an ending and a few important scenes along the way. We have to have that hard decision, you know, that they have to figure out what's going on. And we have to give them the reasons to make that hazardous EVA trek all the way across the cable to bring back a supply of oxygen. Now, Joe told me that early versions of Stowaway had water being the primary uh, limiting resource. But after they talked to engineers at JPL, they were convinced to change the problem to the atmosphere. And the first version of the script I saw actually had a flood which also damaged the life support and atmosphere processing system. There was a problem with like an oxygen tank leaking into the habitat. And the first thing I said when I saw that is, you know, if you've got an oxygen tank le leaking, then you're risking an oxygen rich fire. Why don't we have a fire too? Of course, none of this would be in the final version they shot because fires and floods on set would cost a lot to shoot. But what I did do was I actually put together a spreadsheet with some basic models of atmosphere consumption and other consumables to try and tune it to have the outcome that uh, the writers desired. It didn't, I didn't ruin the uh, CDRA, the carbon dioxide removal apparatus, but in my case, I wanted the oxygen recovery system to be messed up because actually dealing with carbon dioxide buildup by bringing over more oxygen is really hard. It's much easier to remove the carbon dioxide if you can. Anyway, the point is, this was never supposed to have a happy ending. And I made a few suggestions to try and eliminate any hope that the crew had. And you probably don't see any of those suggestions on screen in any substantial way, because all of these things are basically wallpaper to the story that the writers wanted to tell. So now that's out of the way, there are a couple of places where I can point to suggestions I made that are straight up on screen and it's really cool to see. First of all, one of my favourite bits of the set design is the wall with the patches from the previous missions. Right? I've paused this and looked at it several times. It also has the signatures of the previous crews and this was actually a suggestion that I'd made based on the fact that astronauts and cosmonauts the, who stay at, at the hotel in Star City while preparing to launch on Soyuz, they sign the hotel doors. 
And so the team then did this for the crew that were living on the HAB and they actually produced a series of patches for all the previous missions and each of these patches gives you clue to the history and evolution of the design of the spacecraft and all the names are also call outs to scientists and astronauts and important people uh, to the crew. And you can see that rotational artificial gravity was only added in the last few missions. And also, you, this is the one place you can actually see the entire rockets. And they're very obviously stylized versions that you see on the patch, but they basically look like Ariane 5 and Ariane 6 rockets. You know, a lot of European crew worked on this. Another moment that's taken directly from one of my emails is when Kim is like looking at the sun and trying to see this prominence on the edge of the solar disk. And originally they just had one of the actors looking at it and saying, oh, I see a prominence on the edge of the sun. And you can't do that because the sun is so bright. But instead he flips down his sun visor and he's holding his hand out to eclipse the sun just to see something on the edge. And yeah, seeing that on the screen is kind of cool. And of course, there is a very direct com uh, contribution from me right at the start in the first few seconds when Mission Control is going through their pre-launch checks. I'm one of the voices. Uh, also alongside astronaut Daniel Barry, who is also a consultant on the movie. Now, the rest of the launch sequence that follows is kind of necessarily you know, rushed, compressed in time so that we can get the characters into space and onto the spaceship quickly. And we don't want to spend hours do detailing the whole rendezvous process. And by the way, if you want a breakdown of the actual launch scene, Joe did one on his channel. He hasn't posted on his YouTube for ages and yeah, he posted one for this. But anyway, one important little bit is the engine underperformance, which a casual viewer of this might just dismiss as being some minor drama that was inserted by the writers to make spaceflight seem more risky. When in fact, it's actually a pointer to the fact that they are carrying extra mass and the engine isn't underperforming, they're just simply too heavy and not getting the speed they need. There are quite a few mistakes in this whole sequence that ended up in there, like they call out Max Q well after they're into space and also they have visors up instead of down the whole time during this critical you know, high risk phase of flight. So, I mean, I talk about being an advisor and a consultant, but yeah, I need to be clear that this was a very casual situation. I would talk on the phone with them. I did some math, sent a few emails. Uh, I didn't meet them in person any time. And that's partly me being unable to spare the time to go to LA and work with them. I wasn't on hand when a lot of minor changes were being made. And so things ended up in the final version that if they'd asked me, I would have suggested something different. But, you know, a lot of advice I give was just in general things to have the writers think about so that they would have the understanding to at least make good decisions when they needed to make uh, decisions in the moment. But yeah, other times that things were changed were sometimes to reduce the production complexity. Uh, in one of my designs for the spacecraft, the support cables actually attached to a truss structure which was higher up and that moved the anchor point away from the center of mass and that would actually was designed to reduce the rocking as people moved around the HAB module and that adjusted its center of mass. But they had to drop that whole truss because it was just adding too much to the budget again because they would have to build this and then that would mean more shots outside. So yeah, the design they have is less stable, but again, designed for shooting the film. Now, even before we get to the EVA sequence, there's one thing that you see on screen that I kind of want to highlight. The characters are sometimes seen wearing these oxygen masks, these breathing masks, and this is actually a nod to astronauts who, when they're going to perform an EVA, they have to pre-breathe with oxygen for several hours because spacesuits use a pure oxygen atmosphere at one-third atmospheric pressure. And if you go from a regular environment to this suit environment, you can actually get decompression sickness unless you've eliminated all the nitrogen from your blood. So I'm sure this was uh, Dan Barry's idea, but it's just really nice to see this thing on screen. And moreover, the characters don't actually talk about this. They don't talk about needing to pre-breathe. It's just something you do because you're an astronaut and every astronaut knows that you pre-breathe. Uh, but it's cool to actually see this on screen in a TV show or movie or anything. I've never seen that anywhere else except real life.
And so yeah, the EVA scene is supposed to be one of the signature scenes, the highlights of the movie. And I'm going to say right away there is a big problem with this. Because um, other than the cable climbing gear, we don't really see much in the way of tethers, right? Latches and harnesses being used, which is something that would absolutely be ever present in a real EVA scenario, you know, to stop you floating away. Although it's not so much a case of floating away. In this case, it's more like you're working on a tall structure where if you fall off, you know, you'll fall, hit the ground and die. In this case, you'll fall off and disappear off to infinity and eventually run out of air and die. But yeah, there should be t more tethers than we see. And yeah, and then there's the, the rush back across the cables to the HAP module. And there's a, a huge problem there because there's she's literally sliding down this cable, holding onto it with her hands. And you know, with a spacesuit, that's adding almost your body weight to yourself. And if you try to do that with your gloves on, you will probably kill yourself, right? <laughs> like, you would have worse problems than just losing the oxygen canister. I guess technically that killed you, but... Yeah, I, I would have had her sliding using one of those, you know, latchy type things and maybe show some, get, show it heating up. That would be kind of cool. Anyway, whatever. Opportunity missed. But equally, in amongst all this, there are a few moments where things really do look amazing. I mean, I, I do like the moment where they're sort of moving over this hub in the middle and you just get to see the random hardware in there. I love it when you see them. They've reached the bottom and they're standing on top of this booster, rappelling down the edge and just opening that door and watching it swing off to infinity, right? It's the whole thing. It really is a unique set piece that I've never seen anywhere else on, on screen. And finally, yes, there's that solar storm and the radiation effect. And, you know, I'm going to say the radiation being visible is something that was described in the original script. And of course, right away, I knew that this made no sense scientifically. You can't really see radiation. I mean, OK, if you know, a relativistic particle hits your eyeball, it might produce blue light from Chernenko radiation. But, you know, that's not what we're seeing here. But on the other hand, this is a movie and sometimes movies want to look cool. So it wasn't hard for me to come up with something that was grounded in science that could explain this radiation effect visual. So it's mentioned that the spacecraft has a radiation shelter because, of course, traveling to Mars for months exposes humans to a lot of potential radiation hazards. And for the storms, they would go into this thing and seal themselves up and protect them from the radiation. Now, there were some designs of radiation shelters that actually use active shielding, right? They, they use electromagnetic fields to deflect charged particles. So I basically remember telling Joe that maybe they're just using some version of this that involves a trapped plasma that creates an artificial aurora effect. So if you really want to go with the cool VFX shots, then you can totally explain it away by that. I give you permission, right? That being said, I don't know what the red spots are about. But look, it's fun to pick apart science in other people's stories. It's equally fun to try and come up with ways to try and bend science to match your story. I'm really glad to have the chance, and I think the end product stands up very well. Uh, I mean, it's a low-budget movie that looks better than a lot of high-budget space movies because they made a lot of smart decisions about how to shoot it. If I'd made the same movie, uh, I, I would have done a lot of things differently. I mean, I certainly wouldn't have made the, <laughs> these mistakes, but equally, I probably wouldn't have had the courage to give it the unhappy ending. I think my style is much more talking about how the problems are solved because that's fun. But equally, you know, you have to put in as much work to make sure you can't solve the problems and get to the ending that Stowaway gives us. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.